My name is Rebecca Johnson, and I love Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice. And I am publishing a series of videos exploring the reasons why I am such a fan of Zack Snyder's film. In this series, you'll find my thoughts on topics that matter to me, like Larry Fong's cinematography, character analysis on Lex Luthor and Lois Lane, the Christian imagery, what I find hopeful about the movie, and yes, I'll address the critical reception. So if you're interested in any of those topics, I hope you will get something out of this series and find out why Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice has had such a profound, heartfelt, and inspiring impact on my life. Welcome to the Duck Milk Prod YouTube channel. My name is Rebecca Johnson, and this live stream is part of a series I am calling Reading Reviews with Rebecca, which will analyze the critical reception of Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice through the negative reviews written by top critics from Rotten Tomatoes, one review at a time. And this series is not meant to belittle anyone's opinions, but rather serve as a study of art criticism and how we discuss film. And I'm hoping that this endeavor will encourage us all to be better consumers of cinema. Today, I'll be reading through a review from Real Views. That's R-E-E-L Views, not like R-E-A-L Views. So Real Views uh, that doesn't have a title that I can tell, but it was written by James Berardinelli. So I hope I'm saying that correctly, James. Uh, the link to this review is in the video description below. If you'd like to follow along and read it for yourself, I encourage you to do that so that you uh, can know that this is a real review that a real person wrote. Uh, so if James uh, should ever see this video and watch this video, I just want to say that I'm aiming to do this as civilly and analytically as possible. And I would ask that anyone watching live with me or uh, posting in the comments later would do the same. I'm simply taking a look at the criticism for and of BVS now from an historical point of view, given that these reviews were used by Warner Brothers in their decision making process regarding the DC Extended Universe. Due to the poor reviews for Batman v Superman, the tone and approach to the franchise were changed for Justice League and ultimately led to the destruction of the Snyderverse. And before I get into James's thoughts, I'm sure there are people out there who are like, well, He's a professional movie critic. What what do you have to say about it, Rebecca? What, what does it matter if you have any opinions? He he has he has the professional outlet that he's writing for, and you know what? I think that's a fair it's a fair question. Uh, so I am going to give you a little bit of background on me, and uh, then we'll get started with the review. I graduated from the University of Alabama, Roll Tide, with a degree in telecommunications and film, and a focus on broadcast television production. While I've never been to film school, in my television and production experience, I've learned about and have lots of practice in operating cameras, shot composition, and editing. Lighting, green screen, and audio are my weak spots, admittedly, but I've been working on those. After working in local TV news, running cameras, and working in production, I got a job at Turner, now Warner Media, or whatever they're calling themselves now, for 14 years. I worked with networks, or brands as they call them now, like TBS, TNT, Adult Swim, Cartoon Network, Boomerang, True TV, and Turner Classic Movies as a video encoding specialist. I also did a fair amount of closed captioning work and DVD and Blu-ray QC. In case you are wondering how I uh, podcasted about Supergirl and the DCEU films while working for a Time Warner company, I actually got permission and clearance from my human resources representative. If you think I wouldn't criticize stories that were under the same corporate umbrella, that was never a problem nor a concern for me. If I thought the Supergirl TV series or a DCEU film had faults, <laughs> I said so. In the last 17 years, I have served as a director, technical director, and camera operator at my local church in a live production capacity. I've been a video editor for 17 years, having worked in Avid, Final Cut, and Premiere Pro CC. In my day job, I shoot and edit news and documentary style video content that involves interviews and narrative storytelling. I'm also currently an amateur photographer and am aiming to improve my efforts in still photography. You can check out my work over at Instagram at the Derby Kid. Link is in the video description below. While discussing these film reviews, music and film scores will inevitably come up. It may be good to know that in my life, I have played piano, handbells, clarinet, bass clarinet, bassoon, acoustic guitar, and have even started learning how to play the ukulele. I've played in marching bands, symphonic bands, and wind ensembles, and have sung in many choirs. While I don't consider myself a world-class musician, 
Far from it, actually. I do know some things about music and am a big fan of film scores and soundtracks. In addition to my production and musical experience, I have had lots of experience in art criticism. I've been podcasting about television and film since 2009 and do so on a regular basis with Supergirl Radio, a podcast I co-host about the CW Supergirl TV series. I am also a writing contributor to the Justice League Universe podcast that offers analysis on the DCEU films. You might even hear my voice occasionally in recordings and audio commentaries over there. I'm not an expert, but I care deeply about film, television, storytelling, and art. So I hope this gives you a background on where I'm coming from. All right, now that we have gotten all that away, uh, out of the way, let's get into James's review from Real Views. Uh, so, okay, the first sentence, though, uh, it's, it's going to really, we're going to have to really dig into this first sentence. Uh, he writes, for those who thought Man of Steel was dark, you ain't seen nothing yet. Uh, and I don't know where James is from, but if he is not from the South, I don't know if that is considered a uh, cultural appropriation or not. I'm just, uh, just asking questions. Uh, <laughs> but he is coming in hot in this review. Uh, it just real right out of the gate, just coming in ha- hot. He's, he's not even as a writer trying to ease you into his negative opinion. He's just putting it right out in the first sentence. Uh, the first sentence here, I do think lacks context. If you sat down and were curious about Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice, but you didn't know anything about it, you'd be wondering probably what Man of Steel had to do with it. Uh, because at that point, as a reader, I'd assume that if you weren't curious and you were like, I don't I don't understand what Man of Steel has to do with this, you, you might stop reading. Or if you were curious, you might then have to go somewhere else to figure out what the connection was between Man of Steel and Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice. Because James here, right off the gate, uh, right out of the gate, uh, doesn't really provide that context for the reader. So uh, I, I guess he just assumes you know what it is, and maybe you do, but uh, I would think that you would want to put some context around those connections. Uh, I am curious, though, since he mentions it, why did he think Man of Steel was, quote, dark? I have a lot of issues with this word. I try not to use it myself because it could mean a lot of things. What does this word even mean here? Does he mean that it was bleak? Did he mean? Uh, d- does he mean that... It uh, it didn't have any light in it. Is it sad? Is it violent? Is it depressing? People use the word dark for so many different meanings uh, that I think it it has lost its <laughs> it's lost its whole purpose in being the word dark. So uh, I wish uh, I wish I could answer any of these questions for myself about James's opinion, but I could not find a review he wrote for Man of Steel, so I actually don't know what he thought about it. So I guess we're just supposed to assume that he thought it was dark somehow, and uh, we, <laughs> we just have to go with that. He goes on to say, uh, Batman v Superman, the battle royale slash team up of DC Comics' revered superheroes is so bleak that the sun never seems to shine. The sun never seems to shine. The characters' faces can't form smiles. And the whole affair is more depressing than fun. Oh, this movie just sounds just so horrible, you guys. Uh, but my, uh, my question about this uh, paragraph is, are these claims by James even true? Uh, I I think we should take a look at it. <laughs> so he makes the assertion that the sun never shines in Batman v Superman. Uh, so I'm going to put that to the test. Uh, if we find one instance of the sun shining in Batman v Superman, his whole argument just crumbles. So let's see how many we can find <laughs> to see, see if the sun really is shining in Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice. Oh, look, right right out of the gate in uh, one of the first, I think the very first sequence with uh, Bruce Wayne and the funeral of Martha and Thomas Wayne. Uh, the sun is out. It is daytime in that sequence. And Bruce Wayne literally gets taken up into the light <laughs> so, by the bats in his his sort of memory, his, his dream. Uh, so there is some sunshine there. Uh, we get to see Lois Lane in Africa. It's daytime. The sun is shining. I bet it's hot where she is. Uh, so there's some sun. Uh, We get uh, the Battle of Metropolis flashback with Bruce Wayne as he runs through the streets of Metropolis. Uh, That's daytime. The sun is out there. Uh, We get to go to the Indian Ocean and there's some sun there uh, with the the 
well, I guess I don't want to say kids because it's probably a young, the young men who are diving into, I don't know what their ages are, uh, but they are diving into the ocean to recover the uh, kryptonite for Lex Luthor. So it's, I mean, it looks beautiful. This looks like you would want a vacation there. Uh, except for the the whole world engine and the water and the kryptonite M might be uh, radiation somehow, but it looks beautiful. It looks beautiful. Other than that, it would be a great place to vacation. Uh, so it's sunny there. Uh, uh, Alfred hanging out at uh, Bruce's house where the Bat Cave is. Uh, it's daytime. Looks nice outside. L again, this looks like a, a perfectly nice place to vacation. If you wanted to go for a weekend at the lake house, <laughs> this would be a great spot to go to. Uh, let's see. During the Day of the Dead sequence with Superman saving the uh, the space rocket. Of, I don't know what you would call that. Some sort of a uh, space vehicle that's daytime's out there. It's sunning there. Uh, sunny there. Uh, we have uh, the sun shining when Superman goes to the Senate hearing. It's a nice day. It's a little cloudy. I would say maybe it's partly cloudy. Maybe you could say partly cloudy, but the sun is out. It is not uh, uh, nighttime. I guess that's what I'm trying to get at. Uh, we also have daytime uh, sun in, I believe this is Washington, D.C. with Lois Lane and General Swanwick. Uh, we even have the uh, daytime uh, with the nightmare sequence. It's not nighttime. Uh, so I guess uh, the sun is some somehow out there, <laughs> even in the post uh, the post apocalyptic world of the nightmare sequence. Uh, the sun still shines. Uh, we have Perry White at the Daily Planet working during the day. You know, he's putting in his hours during the day. It's sunny outside. Must be nice. Uh, we have the sun shining at Heroes Park. Uh, let's see what else we got. Sun is out. Uh, daytime scene with uh, Wallace and Mercy going in to see Lex offering him up a new wheelchair. Uh, we have uh, Lois at the Daily Planet with the sun out there. Uh, so it, it, it must kill Perry and, and Lois to be inside in the office while, uh, while it's a nice day outside. Uh, we also have a daytime sequence with uh, Lex going into the um, scout ship to uh, check out the Kryptonian technology. Uh, it's daytime, and the sun is out Where uh, when we meet Lex Luthor, when we go to LexCorp. It looks like it's nice and shiny in there, coming in through all those windows. Oh, so nice and bright in there. Oh, must be a nice environment that Lex is offering up to his employees. Uh, let's see. It's daytime. The entire funeral sequence uh, is daytime with the sun out. Uh, so I don't know about anyone else, but I think James is wrong in the assertion that the sun never shines in Batman v Superman. So I think we've gone through some things in there, debunked that uh, that uh, argument that he's putting forth. Uh, so maybe he's just, he just has a bad memory. Maybe he just watched it once and, and just assumed that the whole film was shot at night. I don't know, uh, but uh, he's definitely wrong on that case. Um, and I also wonder why why it would be bad. You know, if, if if it was true, if we're going to go with James's uh, assertion here that the sun never shines in Batman v Superman, which it doesn't, there are there's plenty of sequences. There are plenty of sequences when it is uh, sunshine and daytime outside. Uh, but even if there wasn't, is it is it bad? Maybe there could be a reason why the sun wouldn't shine in a scene or was set at night. Could there be a reason why a filmmaker would choose to do that? If, I mean, I, I don't see a lot of films where the entire film is uh, set during the daytime. Maybe those exist. I have a hard time thinking of one where it did. But but you could, you could set it all in the daytime. You could set it all at night. It just kind of depends on what your story is. I recently watched the first Blade Runner. And that's that's a film that is has a lot of scenes at night. But I didn't think it was a bad film because of that. Uh, so I, I find that a, a little odd that somebody would uh, claim that a film is bad because they, they say it has no uh, scenes with sunshine. <laughs> so I say all that to say that maybe there are times in Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice where the sun wasn't shining. And maybe there's a reason for that. So uh, one of the things that I like uh, to bring up is uh, a couple of years ago, I was in a film discussion group. Uh, with some people, and we were talking about a, a, a film, and I, I, to be honest, I can't remember the title of the film. <laughs> the, the film itself wasn't as memorable as the discussion, but we had a discussion about a character who had, uh, I believe, lost someone or had broken. I think, uh, I think the person he loved died, 
And the scene was that he was leaving his house and going outside and it was raining. And in the film discussion group, uh, there was somebody who said, well, I think the rain is a metaphor for his tears for, you know, for the tears that he, you know, he's, he's sad about this and he's, he's crying and the, the rain uh, is his tears. And that just blew my mind wide open. And I think about that so much now when I see uh, a TV show or film, the film especially with TV shows. It, it, I don't, I don't know that some TV shows that I watch go that deep, uh, but a lot of films will incorporate those kinds of things. I've noticed. Uh, so that has really stuck with me that rain could be a metaphor for something. And I find that that is the case, or at least I believe that is the case in in Batman v Superman. So in a couple of cases, we see Lois Lane in the rain. Uh, we see her in the rain when she comes home from her apartment. We see her in the rain when we uh, see her with General Swanwick uh, talking about the investigation that they're they're uh, digging into. And we also see her uh, in, in a cab watching the news and it's raining around her. And the reason that I bring this up is that I think the rain with Lois in Batman v Superman could be tears. It could be foreshadowing that she's going to have a heartbreak, that she's going to lose Clark, that uh, the, the death is coming. Um, so I like the idea of that. I don't know if that's what Zack Snyder intended, but I do think that that could be a reading on these particular scenes with Lois, especially in the rain. Um, now you could have an instance where rain could be different based on the character in the situation. So, I bring uh, Bruce up in this situation. So we've got Lois in the rain, but then we've got a different kind of rain with uh, with Batman, especially. Uh, Batman uh, goes into LexCorp and steals the kryptonite from Lex and he does it. And there's like, there's rain coming down and there's fire that's <laughs> going. I mean, he really busts up into <laughs> LexCorp. Um, and that seems to be a common thing that happens with Batman and Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice, that when Bruce, when, when Batman, I should say specifically, is angry and he's going after, you know, uh, Superman in vengeance, he is in the rain. So the rain could be connected to storms and then the fire could be representative of, of his anger. And we, this is not the only time that we see this. We do see that in the final battle with Batman and Superman when they have their big fight where you see uh, the rain coming down and there's lightning and there's fire. And so I think the idea of having rain be representing something, you know, an emotion from different characters based on their situation and their perspective is really interesting. So I say all that to say <laughs> that the, the forecast that is happening, the weather forecast in Batman v Superman is uh, something that I find very interesting. And I think to dumb it down to a, in a review to say, oh, well, the sun's not shining. A, it's not correct at all. It's a complete lie. The sun shines plenty in Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice. But even if it doesn't in some scenes where it does have rain or it's set at night, there are reasons for that. There's there's a there's a, a, a something that you could look into as film and you know a film reviewer, a film critic to analyze. And I think that's a way more interesting and fun. Pe people in this review, we're going to talk about the F word. It's fun to dig into those things. I have a hard time uh, understanding why a film critic wouldn't want to dig into those kinds of things that make a film so much more interesting. Uh, so I just wanted to point that out. Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, I'm trying to see, look into the chat to see if... Um, if uh, other people had some things to say. So Dennis says, uh, those who that think that BBS is dark have never seen Batman Returns. This is true. There are lots of other superhero movies that have uh, a different uh, aesthetic. And there are uh, reasons that, you know, for example, Batman Returns is dark. It does, uh, it's, it's set a, uh, quite a bit at night. And there are, there are some sad, sad things that go on in Batman Returns, specifically with Oswald Cobblepot. Um, so, uh, so I think that it's perfectly fine for Batman Returns to be dark. So I don't think that that, um, that's, uh, something that is really even that big of a deal. Uh, let's see. Dennis also says, I'm going to make a compelling case for dark superhero movies, the Dark Knight trilogy, Burton's Batman, Logan and the Daredevil TV show. Yeah, there are plenty of uh, 
superhero sh uh, shows and movies that uh, that utilize that really well, and they do it to tell a story. It's not to just have things set at night. Although I know that there are some, uh, like specifically with the Arrowverse, I've heard some directors say that they like to do night scenes because uh, the costumes uh, show up a little bit better when they're at night. They kind of hide some of the the flaws and some. <laughs> some of those costumes because you can't see them as well. So that's why I say that film um, film directors probably take this more to heart than uh, television uh, show directors do. But I think there is some of that. And I think that if it's a good story and you have good visuals to back up to tell your story, uh, that I have no problem with it. So I do think it is kind of strange that a film critic uh, would say that and then uh, not even dig into it. So we also get an assertion from James here that the characters' faces can't form smiles. Huh, well, that's weird. So is everybody in Batman v Superman just angry all the time? Are they just sad all the time? That's that's weird. Let, let's maybe dig into this and see what we can find. So uh, Superman's kind of smirking because he knows he can save Lois. Uh, Clark is smiling because he gets home and Lois Lane is in the bathtub. So that... That probably made him smile. And then when she sees that he brought groceries home to, <laughs> to cook her dinner, that probably made her smile. Uh, Lois also smiles when um, she's reunited with uh, with Superman after he comes back down off the mountain from his Garden of Gethsemane uh, moment. Uh, and she's reunited with him. She's very happy about that. Uh, Superman also smiles at Lois uh, when he he calls her his world and he's about to sacrifice himself. So he's very happy and content with his decision to do that. Bruce Wayne also smiles uh, uh, quite a bit in Batman v Superman. He uh, the, the best you get out of a Bruce Wayne is uh, when he when he knows he's right about something <laughs> or he's trying to play it off as a as a playboy. So he smirks with the, the guy in the underground fight club because uh, he sort of uh, played cagey beast a little bit. Uh, let's see. You also get him uh, smirking at Mercy Graves <laughs> when he's saying, I like those shoes. Uh, he also uh, smiles a little bit with Diana because she uh, sort of plays along his same his same line there and she kind of keeps toe-to-toe uh, -to -toe with him. So uh, they smile at each other and they're having a good time. Uh, Diana uh, loves to uh, get into battle and fight with monsters. Uh, so Wonder Woman's having a good time. And I also think it's worth noting that the person maybe having the most fun in Batman v Superman is Lex Luthor. He smiles quite a bit. <laughs> he smiles when he meets the senators. He smiles when they bring him uh, General Zod's dead body. He smiles when he gets to interact with Clark and Bruce at the party. His plan is coming together. He uh, smirks a little bit uh, when he knows that Senator Finch is about to be blown to bits. And he has a pretty good time when Superman comes up and uh, uh, encounters Lex on the rooftop. So Lex Luthor having a great time, uh, really enjoying himself, uh, <laughs> seeing his plan uh, come together. So uh, to say that the characters don't smile in uh, Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice, I would also come to the conclusion is false. And we have uh, video evidence uh, pictorial evidence uh, to say otherwise. So I just wanted to go through th some of those things. Uh, so uh, I also don't uh, think it's more depressing than fun, but you know what? Everybody's fun is a little different, maybe, I guess we could say. <laughs> so I, I think watching a great film is fun. That's what I consider to be fun. Uh, so James continues on. He writes, quote, there's a little doubt that director Zack Snyder is trying to out Nolan, Christopher Nolan, who gets an executive producer credit when it comes to leeching the light out of superheroes. Nolan, however, understood that the internal darkness needs to be a byproduct of careful character development and narrative thrust. All right. So uh, I guess I have a question. So how does Zack Snyder not, quote, understand that internal darkness needs to be a byproduct of careful character development and narr narrative thrust, unquote? Uh, because I think that Zack Snyder does prove uh, that uh, that he does understand that with the Batman v Superman arcs of Bruce Wayne and Lois Lane and Clark Kent. They all have their issues. They're working out in the film. And by the end of it, they come to a peaceful and optimistic endpoint. 
yes, there are instances when sadness comes into play. It is a story about the death of Clark Kent slash Superman. So there is a sadness about that. But in the end, they all find a way to cope with it. Bruce Wayne has internal darkness, which every Batman does. It's kind of Batman's thing to have an internal darkness that play. And, and specifically, Ben Affleck's Batman has an internal darkness that uh, plays out in his e external actions of being more violent and abandoning his own rules as Batman. His entire story is driven by revenge and a sense of duty to the world to kill Superman before he can do anything to harm everyone on Earth. By the end of the film, though, he finds a connection with Superman and realizes that he isn't the threat he once thought he was. Through the Martha rescue sequence, he starts to become the Batman he once was that was brought into the light, and he ends up taking care of Martha Kent in the end by not only saving her life and giving catharsis over his own mother's death for himself, but by paying the funeral costs and alleviating Martha Kent's financial struggles. Uh, Clark Kent, uh, in, in terms of this internal uh, darkness discussion, he experiences doubts about himself as Superman and trying to do the right thing. But in the end, he finds his reason to keep going in his love for Lois Lane. He chooses to save the world because she, his, she is his world. She is the example of humanity for him and a reason he should fight for it, even at the cost of his own life. And with Lois Lane, she even has something of an internal darkness in the film because of her sadness and watching Clark Kent go through the pain of the world questioning him. She overcomes this, I think, by actively trying to figure out who is setting Superman up. Instead of sitting around and being sad about it, which she could have done, she does what she can to help and I think ends up being the reason Lex Luthor goes to prison by the end of the film. She has proven what Lex has done and because the world knows that Superman didn't do the things he was accused of, they can mourn him as a hero and they do. In the end, Lois helps save Superman's reputation even if she couldn't physically save him from dying. And even, uh, I guess, uh, internal darkness could be uh, applied to Lex Luthor, even with a villain like Lex, who has his own internal darkness. I, I think Zack Snyder does a good job of explaining why Lex has issues with God and Superman. And over the course of the film, showcases how Lex is carrying those issues out. His character arc even ends with a physical change into becoming the Lex Luthor he needs to be with the shaving of his head. It, all, it only happens once he becomes the Superman villain he should be through his success in killing the Man of Steel. So uh, I don't really understand uh, James's point here about the internal darkness because I think Zack Snyder uh, handles that quite well with a lot of characters. So uh, James continues on by writing, quote, Snyder has a more brute force approach he doesn't allow for the possibility of brightness or traditional heroism. Batman v Superman revels in apocalyptic visuals, death, destruction, mayhem, and brutality. Despite the title, there's no dawn in this movie. It's all dusk, headed into a moonless, starless night. So I'm sure James was like thinking that last sentence was so clever i mean he's just knocking it out of the park he really he took the dawn part of the movie and he really he played on it with his words so really congratulations to james for the um for the play on the dawn in the title um but i have to disagree with you uh james and some of these points in your paragraph here even if you're your your wordsmithing uh was good uh the only part of this paragraph that is true is in my opinion is that snyder revels in apocalyptic visuals uh everything else i don't think it's true <laughs> snyder does allow for brightness when it is called for when the story and the film require it as all good filmmakers should that <laughs> that should be you know you shouldn't have to make everything bright if you don't want to if you don't think it's going to uh, be part of the storytelling process. You, sh you should be doing what you can as a filmmaker to make the script come to life. Uh, Snyder also, I believe, also does allow for traditional heroism. Uh, I, I don't understand uh, what James is saying that, that he doesn't uh, because Superman rescues Lois Lane multiple times. Lois Lane rescues Superman multiple times. There's an entire Day of the Dead sequence showing Superman saving the day. Superman... Uh, uh, flies doomsday and the nuclear bomb up into space and away from civilians. Superman uh, slides the kryptonite spear into doomsday, even though he already has one of doomsday's spikes uh, struck through his chest. Bruce Wayne runs into danger while everyone else runs away. And he does this, by the way, without any 
bat suit or any bat gadgets. Uh, Batman saves victims of sex trafficking. Batman uh, saves Martha uh, Kent from the uh, Martha rescue sequence. Uh, Wonder Woman saves Batman. So I guess I'm a little confused about uh, James's assertion here that Zack Snyder doesn't allow for traditional heroism. Uh, I would I would classify those actions as traditional heroism. So I guess I guess I'm a little confused about that point. I also don't understand how Zack Snyder revels in death. Is it because he bookends the film with two funerals? I, I'm guessing. I don't know. James didn't really uh, expand on that. So I'm, I'm guessing uh, death, funerals. I guess that's what he's, he's getting at. But my question is, how would that be reveling in death? Couldn't it be that he's just telling a story of how death has affected Bruce Wayne? That's actually doing the opposite of what James is claiming here. The death of his parents and the death of Superman both brought Bruce Wayne to the light. So this is not reveling in death so much as it's reveling in the fact that these, these two losses in his life brought him to a better place. Uh, I also uh, don't understand the claim that Snyder revels in destruction. The, the film makes a big deal out of the fact, goes out of its way uh, to make sure that the audience know that the big fights are taking place in abandoned areas and around the abandoned buildings. Uh, does James really expect that the DC Trinity is going to fight Doomsday without destruction? Is that really a realistic expectation? Uh, I, I, I would think that if there was no destruction, that it, it wouldn't be very realistic. So I, I think you have to have a little bit of that in there. Um, I also don't understand how Snyder is reveling in mayhem and brutality. I'm guessing James is uh, remarking here about Batman's more brutal behavior. That's my guess. I don't really know. He doesn't explain it. Um, so I'm not really sure what he's referring to here. But if it is about Batman's more brutal behavior, doesn't the brutality from Batman and BBS play into his character arc? Isn't there a change that Bruce and Batman go through from the beginning of the film until the end of the film? And shouldn't Batman be somewhat brutal when battling thugs intending to burn Martha Kent alive? Is he supposed to just ask them politely not to do it? <laughs> is that, is that going to work? Or does he need to fight them for it? Uh, and then uh, James also says that there's no dawn in the movie. Uh, did he go to the restroom during the last 15 minutes of the film? Because uh, that's the only way I could understand that he would come to that conclusion because the last 15 minutes are uh, set during the daytime and it's beautiful. And uh, so I would assume that that was the dawn in the dawn of justice. Uh, so, okay. I just uh, had some questions there about some of the things that, um, that uh, James is writing here. Yeah, Dennis says, when Superman fights in the comics, it makes the fights in the Snyderverse look like water fights. See, this is really interesting. I think people who don't read the comics, don't watch the animated stuff, don't watch, you know, uh, even past versions of Superman in live action. I mean, you go back and watch the Christopher Reeve, you know, I think it's Superman 2 when uh, he fights General Zod. They're, they're throwing trucks and buildings are crashing and... Uh, even Superman and Lois, uh, this last week, I think the Eradicator episode of season one, there was a ton of destruction in there, <laughs> you know, like that's what happens when, uh, you know, beings with powers are going to fight each other. I mean, this happens in Superman stuff all the time. So it's, it, it, this baffles me. This has been baffling me since Man of Steel came out in, uh, 2013, because, if you, if you just watch even the bare minimum of Superman and other forms of media or in or read in comics, the, it, this is just the norm. Zack Snyder was just bringing that stuff to the big screen. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I just, I have a hard time understanding that. Um, Dennis also says people need to understand that Snyder's goals in the movie is to have the strength of mythology triumphing, uh, triumphing over humanity's cynicism. I think that's a really good way to put that. Um, so, uh, so thank you for sharing that. Uh, let's see. Uh, Andy says, I think James fell asleep during the film and had someone sitting next to him, giving him a sloppy recap. You know what? I wouldn't doubt it. If that's what happened. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder about these reviews uh, just because some of them just don't uh, seem to even get uh, basic things right. Um, and yeah, Dennis says brutalizing thugs is Batman 101. 
That's just what he does. Now, in B BBS, to be fair, he is uh, a little more brutal. We know that he's breaking his his own rules and he's uh, not doing what he used to do. And Alfred is uh, chiding him for it. So there is that in the film, that there is something different that uh, Batman is doing when he is going out into the streets. All right. So to continue on, James writes, uh, quote, to get to the conceit advertised by the title, the narrative goes through some interesting contortions. Batman v Superman figures out a way to establish the superheroes as rivals rather than buddies. Each questions the uh, the other's legitimacy. Batman, played by Ben Affleck, watched friends die as a result of Superman's battle with Zod and Man of Steel. He's also concerned about the future possibility of Superman turning against his adopted planet, unquote. Yeah, I mean, that seems like uh, a couple of uh, legitimate reasons to get into a fight with Superman. I think that's uh, well stated, James. I think you I think you really understood that. So those those seem like uh, good reasons to uh, to have uh, Bruce or Batman uh, want to fight Superman. I think that makes sense. Uh, James also says, quote, meanwhile, Superman, played by Henry Cavill, sees the Dark Knight of Gotham as a dangerous vigilante, unquote. That also seems like a good reason to be in a fight with Batman. So, I mean, James is really knocking it out of the park with these. Uh, James also says, quote, to even the playing field when these two square off, Snyder introduces Kryptonite, unquote, which only makes sense uh, that Snyder would do that uh, so that Batman can have a fighting chance. This happens in stories where Superman and Batman fight all the time. Batman, even traditionally in comic book stories and some animated uh, media, will have a little bit of Kryptonite around just in case Superman goes rogue. That's also happened even on the Arrowverse with uh, Batwoman and Supergirl. So uh, this this is stuff that Zack Snyder is just pulling pulling from comics and pulling from other media. And so these, these things make sense. So I'm glad that James points that out. He also writes, quote, with Superman diminished, he and Batman can pound on each other for a while. Meanwhile, super genius Lex Luthor, played by Jesse Eisenberg, is up to no good. Although, thankfully, this time he's interested in more than a real estate scam, unquote. You know, I think I th I agree with James here. It's really nice to have a fresh take on Lex Luthor, isn't it? It's so nice <laughs> that, that uh, this time around he wasn't really interested in real estate. He had his own reasons for doing things, uh, and he wasn't just a copycat of Gene Hackman. So, that was really nice to see. Sort of brought Lex Luthor into the modern world. Uh, James also says, quote, Snyder is a visual director and Batman v Superman, it at its strongest during the special effects laden action sequences, unquote. Uh, so clearly an editor didn't proofread this. I think James meant what he meant was Batman v Superman is at its strongest, not Batman v Superman, it at its strongest. Uh, it sort of reads like Bizarro wrote that sentence. Um, so I, I don't know, m maybe you do a little spell check or something. Uh, I, I'm really surprised that he, 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 I guess he wrote this in Microsoft Word. I would think that Word would catch it. My Google Docs have caught it. Uh, so it's a little strange that so this passed without anybody catching uh, the, the wording in that sentence. But even disregarding this typo that I found, I agree with James that BBS has some great special effects laden action sequences. I think there's some great uh, special effects that go along in BBS. Uh, James goes on to say, quote, when it comes to character development, however, Snyder shows his Achilles heel. None of the familiar and in some cases iconic individuals in Batman v Superman come to life. They're avatars. Cavill's Superman looks the part, but where's the heart? It's no coincidence that the actor's performance as Clark Kent is unimpressive or that his chemistry with Amy Adams' is Lois Lane is non-existent. Non -existent. Cavill in this film for one reason, his appearance. Oh, no, he, he writes, Cavill is in this film for one reason, his appearance. Put him in the suit and he's perfect. Yet one could argue that Christopher Reeve and Brandon Routh, both inferior actors to Cavill, did better jobs. All right, well, a lot to dissect here in this paragraph. He really does not like Henry Cavill's Superman or Amy Adams' Lois Lane, so we're, <laughs> we're going to get into that. Uh, so where's the heart of uh, Cavill's Superman and BBS? Uh, I thought that would have been obvious to most people, but it seems like James is having a hard time with, with this question. Um, how about in his relationship with Lois Lane? He finds, I think... He finds his heart in the conversation with the ghost of the hallucination of Jonathan Kent. He realizes that he can overcome all of his struggles by leaning into the love 
of Lois Lane, who is his world. Lois gives Clark faith that there is good in the world, and the love he has for her gives him the strength to fight and to die with Doomsday. So that, to me, uh, feels like there's a lot of heart in there. You also get some heart uh, between uh, Clark and his mother uh, with Martha, who encourages him quite a bit. Uh, so I guess I'm a little confused. What what does he expect uh, out of Superman to have heart? Because I think there's plenty of heart with Henry Cavill's Superman. Even if James thinks that Henry and Amy's chemistry is non-existent, which I would disagree with, I'm a little baffled he couldn't look at the story and the character journeys and, the, and say there is no heart to Henry Cavill's Clark Kent or Superman. I, I don't know. This isn't rocket science. I mean, it's kind of there. It's it's a big thematic thing in the film uh, of Lois being Superman's world. Uh, so I, <laughs> how you would how you would watch that and say there was no heart to his character is uh, is a little strange in my opinion. Um, and I guess you could argue, as James did, that Christopher Reeve and Brandon Routh did better jobs as Superman, but. How is this relevant to the film analysis of Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice, and Henry Cavill's performance? Why does that need to be in this review? I don't think it's relevant at all. <laughs> Maybe if you were writing an editorial about the different versions of Superman, that would probably be appropriate for that. But to, to bring in Christopher Reeve and Brandon Routh in a movie which neither of them starred in, that's irrelevant. It's completely irrelevant to the analysis. Uh, let's see. James goes on to say, quote, Affleck's Batman is poorly served, stripped of context and dropped unceremoniously, unceremoniously into a new universe. And he spells N-I-N space T-O to a new universe. The Cape Crusader comes across as a bitter man who parades around in a costume, unquote. I really don't mean to be a stickler here, but <laughs> uh, is it more correct to have into as an in T-O one word? instead of uh, I-N space T-O as two words here. Uh, my Google Docs are spell checking and seem to think so. So I'm, I'm curious what other people might say uh, to that because it does seem to be another indication that somebody did not look over uh, this article or this review. So uh, I think that's a little unfortunate. But more seriously though, how is Ben Affleck's Batman stripped of context? We get nothing but context from, from him in BBS. In his very first scene, we get to find out how he fits into this universe uh, with the Battle of Metropolis. He has a business in Metropolis. We see that he had friends and colleagues there. We see that he witnessed the battle. And that's how it formed his worldview and motivation about Superman. So when they drop him into this film, there's context galore surrounding <laughs> Ben Affleck's Batman. So I'm a little uh, confused about that. Uh, James goes on to say, quote, Bruce Wayne is underdeveloped and Batman is just a guy in a bulletproof suit with a gravelly voice. The change of actor isn't the problem. Batman, like James Bond, is flexible enough to survive a lead switch. Instead, it's the stripping away of anything except the bare bones origin. We don't know who this Batman is, and the filmmakers are in such a rush to get to Justice League out the door that they don't bother to establish a foundation for this iteration of the superhero. Wow. Wow underdeveloped is the word he's going here <laughs> going with here one of the best elements of bbs and the story of bbs is bruce wayne's character arc we see the murder of his parents and what leads him to becoming batman we know uh that he had rules and he isn't abiding uh by them anymore we know he had a robin who died at the hands of the joker we get to spend time in the bat cave and we get to spend time with alfred uh we see why he wants to kill superman we see him learning how to do that through the use of kryptonite and he spends a good chunk of the earlier parts of the film tracking the kryptonite down through investigation we see him develop a connection to both clark and diana we see his redemption and rebirth through uh the martha rescue we see him changed at clark's funeral ready to form the justice league we even see the visual signal that he is a changed by man by not branding lex luther at the end ben affleck's batman is one of the most developed characters in the film so to say that he is underdeveloped I don't, I don't know what to do with that. I really don't know what to do with that. I'm trying to be so nice and understanding. Um, but this is just not true. This is just not true. Um, 
So I'm just, uh, I have to say that uh, because I could go on and on about Ben Affleck's Batman and his arc. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm just going to hop in here into the chat and see what some folks are talking about. Uh, so Andy says, we'll never get to the point of comparing Superman actors when all of them have played such different takes with only similarities of being that they are optimistic co costume heroes. That's true. You have to look at the Superman who is you know, you have to look at the context and the era and the decade that they might be pulling from. Uh, for example, Christopher Reeve's Superman is pulling from the Silver Age of Superman. There's a lot of Silver Age influence because it was uh, uh, put out in the 1970s, 1978. So that would have been uh, kind of around that time they'd be pulling mostly from the Silver Age of Superman. So that's why his Superman is so different. Where When you compare him to Henry Cavill, who was more Bronze Age, Modern Age Superman, different eras, just d completely different eras that they're pulling from. Um, so you have to look at the time period and the context and the motivation of what they're going through. Uh, you can't just, they're not, it's, not, it's not apples to apples, it's apples and oranges. Uh, and I think Dennis is making that similar point. Both Reeves and Ralph played a pre-crisis Superman, an idealized hero, but Cavill is playing post-crisis Clark Kent and every man with superpowers, and they play different versions of the character. Great point. It's kind of what I was saying as well, but you you segmented out uh, based on uh, based on crisis, which, which I think is a great way to look at that. Definitely true. All right, well, let's see what James has to say about Wonder Woman. So James says, quote, Wonder Woman, played by Gal Gadot, is shoehorned in as an example of fan service. Her introduction and incorporation are awkward and artificial, and she serves no real purpose beyond helping to jumpstart Justice League. She has no story, no character, and minimal background. She's just there. Her present more, presence more than any other narrative cue makes it clear that Snyder views this as bridging material between Man of Steel and Justice League. Woo! Woo! It's getting hot in here. This is a hot, this is a hot take. This is a real hot take. <laughs> so I, I can understand the argument that Diana is shoehorned in. Uh, I, I, I can I can understand what he's talking about. But at the same time, she is also developed within the film. We don't get much of her background here other than the photograph, but we do know that she's lived a long time. We do know that she has been around since at least 1918. We know that she is international. We know that she uh, has the capability to do certain things. Uh, but it's intentionally done that way, I think, and I, I'm pretty sure this is correct, that, uh, that Snyder was holding back a little bit with Wonder Woman so that because he is a team player and was a team player uh, throughout all of his uh, run with the DC films that he was holding back a little bit with Diana because he wanted Patty Jenkins to be able to handle her origin story and tell us all of this stuff. So the the way that the films are structured and the, the way that he's going to introduce her in Batman v Superman to kind of get you interested and see, oh, what, what is this Wonder Woman about? Well, then you're going to get a movie uh, not long after that that's going to tell you what this Wonder Woman is about. But it's going to be handled by a different director. And that's one of the cool things about Zack Snyder is that he, he did enough to introduce you to the characters, but he wanted to have the big grand mythological stuff uh, saved for the directors who were handling the origin story. So he did that with James Wan and Aquaman. He did that with Wonder Woman uh, and Patty Jenkins. Uh, uh, Patty Jenkins's run on the films. He also did what he needed to do with the Flash, but he wanted to, you know, leave a little open so that whoever was going to direct the Flash film could come in there and do what uh, he or she. And uh, uh, you know, of course, now we know who the directors of the Flash are. Uh, uh, Andy Miss. Muschietti. So I, I think that's right. Uh, but Andy Muschietti could take over and do whatever he wanted to do with the Flash film. Um, so that's that's intentionally done that way because he didn't want to do everything with Wonder Woman in his film because he knew Patty Jenkins was going to come in and make a film. So there's a reason why that happens. It's not just because he didn't want to do anything with Diana. It's not because he he thought she was pointless. It's because she he wanted to introduce her in a very pivotal moment of Superman's story that would lead to bigger things for Wonder Woman. And guess what? It's paid off enormously successful. Wonder Woman in from 2017, huge, massive hit. Everyone loved it. Wonder Woman 1984, not so much. But Wonder Woman, Gal Gadot's Wonder Woman is, is now this generation's Wonder Woman, all thanks to Zack Snyder, because uh, he kind of saved Gal Gadot's uh, career, and she would tell you that. Uh, so just put out a respect for that. But I would also say, 
that uh, Diana is not just there. She does. She's she's not purposeless. Uh, she does develop a rapport with Bruce Wayne. And by the end of the film, they are the two who are going to go find the others who are like them. And they're going to try to start the Justice League and form the Justice League. That's what's called a purpose. James even admits it here in his review. She doesn't need a purpose beyond helping to jumpstart the Justice League film. That is her purpose. And that's okay. <laughs> so uh, so I, I, I disagree with him there. Uh, James goes on to say, quote, Amy Adams is unconvincing. Unconvincing is Lois Lane. I thought she was miscast in Man of Steel and nothing in Batman v Superman has prompted a change of opinion. As a love interest for Superman slash Clark, she doesn't work and the script too often makes the supposedly strong independent woman into a damsel in distress. Oh. I just, you know, reading that makes me think they just they just mishandled Lois Lane. Oh, gosh, what, what have they done with Lois Lane in this film? Uh, but I guess my question here is, how can Amy Adams' Lois Lane be a damsel in distress if she saves Superman? Superman on multiple occasions. How does that work? I don't know. I need, a, I need an answer to that question. Also, how is she supposedly strong? When she interviews terrorists in Africa, she goes head to head with Lex Luthor. She uh, gets uh, him sent to prison in the end and she's able to pick herself back up after Clark dies. She's sad, but she's still carrying on. You know what? That is not supposedly strong. That is strong. So I, uh, I really find the, uh, the idea of Amy Adams's uh Lois Lane not being strong. That's that's really kind of an insult to to women who go out there and you know real life women who go out there and do some of this kind of stuff. Uh, those are kick butt women. And Amy Adams as Lois Lane is so good in Batman v Superman. So I I find I find this a little baffling. Uh, but uh, you know what? That's James's opinion, I guess. Uh, let's see. James also has some thoughts about Alfred. He writes, quote, newcomer Jeremy Irons isn't a good, he's not a good match for Alfred, although the character is strangely portrayed. His constant disapproval of Master Bruce at times verges on contempt. It's not a, con it's not a comfortable or appealing relationship. You know, what, what would it be like if in Batman v Superman, Alfred was just like, you know what, Bruce, you're doing all the right things. You're just, you're really, you're really knocking it out of the park with this Batman thing. I really, you're doing, you're doing such a good job. Thank you for, you know, doing a great service to the city. That, that's not, that's not the story. <laughs> that's a complete misunderstanding of the story. Uh, strangely portrayed. Maybe this Alfred Pennyworth verges on contempt because he disapproves about the way Bruce has been carrying out his activities as, Bat as Batman. Maybe it's because Bruce used to be Batman in a better and healthier and more productive way, and now he's more aggressive and brutal, breaking rules that he set up for himself. I don't know how one can actually write a review complaining about the brutality depicted in a film and then complain about one of the characters calling it out. That that seems a little, a little hypocritical. There's a little budding of opinions there. So I don't know how you can uh, resolve both of those opinions and make them both have any weight. Uh, because the, the reason that Alfred is contentious with Bruce is he's trying to remind him uh, of what Batman used to be. And he's trying to get Bruce to wake up to what he's doing because he knows that Bruce is making a lot of bad mistakes. So you know what? I think Jeremy Irons is a good match. Uh, for Alfred. I, you know what? I would go on to say that I think he's perfect as Alfred. That's my opinion on that subject matter. Uh, and uh, I love him as Alfred. So there's that. Uh, James goes on to say he's, he, he, he needs to talk about Lex now. He says, quote, on the other hand, Jesse Eisenberg's Lex Luthor is a breath of fresh air. Gone is the bumbling semi-comedic version, uh, a sade, Oh, I like that word, assayed by Gene Hackman in the Kevin Spacey's more sinister one, which they were basically kind of the same character. Uh, since this version, uh, since this vision of Luther is as a psychotic Mark Zuckerberg, who better to play him than the actor who did such a phenomenal job in the social network. Luther's endgame is obtuse, but he's brilliant and unhinged, and that makes for a great supervillain. Plus, he's got kryptonite, unquote. You know, I, I, this is a twist I didn't see coming. I did not see that James was going to love Jesse Eisenberg's Lex Luthor. That's a plot twist. Uh, but you know what, James? I agree with all of this. 
I agree with this whole this whole paragraph. All great points. All great points, James. 100%. Love it. Uh, and then he goes on to say, quote, at 154 minutes, Batman v Superman runs too long after a rousing first 15 minutes to show the Man of Steel uh, Superman slash Zod fight from another perspective. The film becomes a slog for the next half hour as it introduces Batman and realigns Superman. I can understand this point. BVS is indeed a long film, so I don't think it's, you know, a, a problem if he thought that the, the pacing wasn't there. Then, you know, that's a fair criticism. Uh, James also goes on to say, throughout, there's too much reliance on dream sequences, unquote. Maybe it's because I have a high expectation for what a film critic is supposed to do, but shouldn't James be examining why those dream sequences exist in the film instead of saying, oh, there's too much of them? Why do you suppose they are there, James? Why do you, why do you think there's dream sequences in there? Did, did James think about this or did he just want to complain about it? I know Tumblr, I know Tumblr users. Shout out to Pulp Clitora, uh, .tumblr .com, uh Link in the video description if you want to check it out. I know Tumblr users who put more effort into their analysis of Batman v Superman. Pulp Clitora actually provided value in an analysis about BBS and the revenge tragedy structure, which you guessed it, uses dream sequences as part of an exploration on madness so maybe there was a reason maybe there's a reason those dream sequences exist maybe maybe next time you watch a film and you're like wow there's there's a lot of dream sequences in this film maybe there's a reason ask ask the, ask my favorite question when i'm watching a, a film why why are there so many dream sequences you might find an answer if you dig in uh deep deep enough it's just just a, a pro tip Ask the question why. Uh, that can lead to some interesting conversations and analysis. Uh, James goes on to say, quote, aspects of the film's ending feel like a cheat and the movie misses an opportunity to do, to do something powerful and radical, opting instead for the predictable climax. What's more powerful, radical, and unpredictable than killing off Superman in his second film? I can't think of anything. <laughs> uh, so James goes on to say quote we're reminded of how impermanent consequences are in most superhero movies that wasn't the case in Christopher Nolan's universe it is the case here okay I don't know what Christopher Nolan has to do with any of this because uh, he did not direct this film uh, he only was an executive producer so I don't really understand why we're mentioning him here um, but I'm also confused about impermanent consequences is James referring to the assumption that Superman will come back to life? I'm really honestly not sure. I don't know what he's talking about here. I wish I knew. I wish he explained a little bit more of this, uh, but he doesn't really go into it. Uh, James also says, uh, quote, once Batman v Superman hits its stride, most viewers will feel equal parts pummeled and immersed, unquote. Uh, I really wish James wouldn't speak for the audience. You can only speak for yourself, sir. You don't know how I feel. You don't know how anyone else feels. I don't know how you feel. Uh, we can only, as people who review things, uh, speak for our perspective and our thoughts. And uh, I personally make it a point to never speak for anyone else uh, because there may be people who disagree with me. I'm not assuming that everyone thinks that I, that I'm not assuming that everyone thinks uh, the way that I do. And I think that's a disrespect to the reading audience to do that. Uh, but if I was going to engage with his point, how would someone feel pummeled and immersed in BBS? And if they did, why is that a bad thing? Isn't being immersed into a film a good thing? Don't you want, as a filmmaker, people to be immersed into your film? Don't you want them to be so immersed that they feel the weight of everything that's going on in it? I can't speak for anyone else, but I would. I would want people to feel, I would want people to feel things. I would want people to be inside my film. Uh, James goes on to say, quote, Snyder is a master of the dark spectacle and he pours it on starting around the movie's midpoint. Thematic overtures, such as the role of superheroes as protectors and whether they should be regulated, are lost in the dust and debris of Batman and Superman's smackdown. The thematic overview, uh, overture, I should say, of superheroes being regulated is only one of the major points of Batman and Superman's Smackdown. 
another major point in that final fight is the thematic overture, if you will, of God versus man with Superman as the godlike figure and Batman representing humanity. Uh, there's a lot of discussion of philosophy and theology that's going on. And so I'm guessing that maybe James feels like the thing he caught on to about the superheroes being regulated wasn't fleshed out because the film, like all good films and scripts, is actually doing more than one thing. There's there's more than one thing going on. If you if you ever ask, uh, I, I one time I took a script writing class and the, the teacher said that your script, your scene should be doing more than one thing. And I think that that's what that final uh, battle between uh, Batman and Superman does really well. So I think there's more of an intention to reconcile the uh, God versus man aspect in that final fight because that's, that's where everything was leading to. And that's uh, everything that they talk about in that scene. Uh, so it's it's possible to do more than one thing uh, with these scenes. Uh, James goes on to say, still, although viewers may be riveted at times, the net experience isn't much fun. Uh, James actually maybe should have edited this to, to say the net experience isn't much fun, dot, 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 to me. I think that's the way he should have written that. This he, he's, right, he's writing to say this wasn't that much fun to james but maybe it was fun for other people i had a i had a great time watching batman v superman because again watching a great film is fun for me um also uh, i have a question why is a cinematic drama supposed to be fun why why if you're intentionally making a drama like a like a, a film that is set in the drama genre why is that supposed to be fun just because they have capes the Batman v Superman Donald Justice is a drama. That is the category you would put it on. Uh, this this isn't a comedy. It's not supposed to be laugh out loud fun times. It's a drama. Uh, James goes on to say, quote, the Avengers and the Force Awakens, to name just two, have illustrated that it's possible to have huge stakes without turning the movie into a relentless downer, unquote. Okay, I can maybe understand why James would bring up the Avengers here because it's in the same superhero film wheelhouse, though I would argue that the movie has nothing to do with Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice and has no place in a review about it. That's what I think. But I can maybe kind of understand why he would put, put the Avengers in here. But what the heck is The Force Awakens doing here? Why, why did The Force Awakens, made by Disney, not even superheroes, this, The Force Awakens, Star Wars, that's sci-fi, galaxy, fantasy, a kind of a fairy tale genre. Uh, you could even say it's a space western. It's not even in the same ballpark. Why is The Force Awakens even doing here? And I, I like that he, he brings up The Force Awakens as if The Force Awakens isn't just a copy of Superman for uh, A New Hope. Uh, so that's interesting. Uh, and then let's just get to the end. Uh, James ends this review saying, quote, Snyder wants his film to be seen as more than a disposable popcorn flick. It's too bad. The only way he can think to achieve that is by singeing the popcorn and depressing the audience. Unquote. Quote. Honestly, I'm really sorry that James had a bad time watching Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice. I really am. I, I I had such a great time watching it every time. I still have a good time watching it when I rewatch it. But I don't like that he tries to speak for me. He's he's not speaking for me. He's thinking that he's speaking for everyone, for speaking for the audience. But he's not. He needs to be speaking for himself. I had so much fun and I was thoroughly entertained by Batman v Superman the first time I saw it. I went home and I danced around my house. I'm not joking. I'm not making this up. I went back to my house. I turned on my uh, playlist and um, I started dancing around my house because I had such a good time. And I was so happy with what I saw and what was delivered to me in a film. I had the best time. And so I really enjoyed myself and I continue to enjoy myself watching Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice. So I'm really, honestly, I'm really sad for him that he didn't enjoy it but please don't speak for me you're not speaking for me you're not speaking for a lot of people who paid a lot of money to go re-watch that film and who have paid a lot of money to get the merchandise and have paid money to buy the blu-rays because they love it so much uh you're not speaking for those people and i really uh, i really wish that reviewers would stop doing that kind of thing talk about your perspective talk about your opinion but don't try to speak for the audience 
uh, because uh, you're not. You can't. There's no way you could speak for the entire audience. Um, okay, let me get into the chat here uh, to see what are, everybody is saying. Uh, Dennis says, Alfred is British. Snark is his first language. Alfred Pennyworth, that's like his thing, is that he... <laughs> He jokes on Bruce Wayne and he, he kind of, uh, that's, that's the great thing about Alfred is that he keeps Bruce in check. That's, that's, he's, he's the mentor. He's the father figure. He's the person, if anybody is going to call Bruce on his, his antics or his bad behavior, it's going to be Alfred. Um, so I think that that's a, a great way to use him in BBS. Uh, Yeah. And Andy backs it up. Has he ever seen Alfred in a Batman story? Alfred is famous for disapproving of Bruce's actions as Batman. That's what he does. That's what he does. Uh, and then uh, Dennis also has a comment about Lois Lane. Uh, the Lois Lane that cracks the entire case before the world's greatest detective even notices there is a case. Uh, yeah, that's that's one of my favorite things about BBS and Amy Adams' is Lois Lane. Is she she out detectives? She out detectives the great detective Batman. Um, so I think that that's really um, something that more people should be uh, talking about. Um, yeah. So I think that's going to wrap it up here uh, in our review of this week's uh, analysis uh, from the top critics of Rotten Tomatoes, uh, specifically this week from James Berardinelli of Real Views. If you missed this live and, and, uh, I'm sorry you did. Thank you to everyone who hung out with me uh, in the live chat. But if you did miss this live, I hope you'll consider sharing your thoughts in the comment section below. You can still do that even if you miss it live. If you ever have any questions about when I'll be live with these live streams, check this YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com slash duckmilkprod. I will always be uh, scheduling them. So if you ever have a question about when I'll be going live, just check the channel. Also, I've uh, uh, a little while ago, I started uh, taking BBS reviews. Uh, the people wanted to share. So if you have a BVS review that you would like to share, comment below this video and give me a link and I will share it in video descriptions of future videos so that everybody can see. I know we're talking a lot about negative reviews about Batman v Superman and uh, the things that uh, at least I disagree with. I, I guess we could say we disagree with because I've been joined by other people in the chat. Uh, but uh, we've been talking about negative reviews, but maybe we could talk about uh, reviews that we think do a good job analyzing uh, Batman v Superman. So if you've got any suggestions, recommendations for reading, uh, share it with me and I will pass it along to everyone else. All right. Well, I think it's the, uh, that time that I'm just going to turn the live stream over to uh, voiceover Rebecca and uh, we'll wrap up this live stream. If you would like to see more of these live streams, make sure to subscribe to this YouTube channel at youtube.com slash duckmilkprod. If you'd like to keep in touch with me personally, you can follow me on Instagram at the Derby Kid and on Vero at Derby Kid. You can hear my thoughts on the CW Supergirl TV series and all things Kara zor over at Supergirl Radio by visiting supergirlradio.com, subscribing wherever you listen to podcasts, or subscribing to the DC TV Podcast YouTube channel, which you can find at youtube.com slash DCTV Podcasts. Also, please check out the Justice League Universe podcast for in-depth analysis on the DCEU films, including Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice. And before I go, I hope that this live stream video series will inspire you to think more critically and thoughtfully about film and storytelling. I'd like to leave you with this quote from C.S. Lewis's book titled An Experiment in Criticism. The truth is not that we need the critics in order to enjoy the authors, but that we need the authors to enjoy the critics. My name is Rebecca Johnson, and I love Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice. And I am publishing a series of videos exploring the reasons why I am such a fan of Zack Snyder's film. In the series, you'll find my thoughts on topics that matter to me, like Larry Fong's cinematography, character analysis on Lex Luthor and Lois Lane, the Christian imagery, what I find hopeful about the movie, and yes, I'll address the critical reception. So if you're interested in any of those topics, I hope you will get something out of this series and find out why Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice has had such a profound, heartfelt, and inspiring impact on my life. 